I was ready to fall in love by John Irving Clark. When I first met her, she seemed young, even for a fresher. This was emphasised by her tendency towards giggling. I'd had one or two things in the university magazine, and she sought me out with a view to submitting some more work. She was painfully enthusiastic, appearing to hang on to my every word. Elizabeth! No! Lit! I'm dropping in the Elizabeth now that I'm at uni, she'd said by way of giggled introduction. She looked as though she'd studied for the part with her jeans and trainers. Her hair was wild and fell over her face, causing her to keep brushing it out of her eyes. Pretty, though. Listen, I said, I hate talking in this coffee bar. Why don't we meet for a drink and talk in more detail? Do you know the fox and grapes? She was only too keen, and we met two or three times before I decided on the next stage. Look, I've got a lot of material back at my flat. Why don't we go through there and sift through it? See if there's anything you can use. She agreed without any persuasion, but I had to warn her. It's no palace, even by student standards. It's a bit damp and cold. We'll need a warmer before we go. I went to the bar and ordered a couple of scotches, doubles. She eyed hers hesitantly before giggling and taking her first sip. I don't usually, she said. Shandy, that's about my limit. Back at the flat, I turned on both bars of the fire, thinking, what the hell? And I gave her a sheaf of poems to look through. Do you write yourself? I asked. No, I don't. Daddy says I'm much more keen than capable. That's why I stood for the editorial committee. I offered a silent prayer of thanks. The last thing I wanted was an evening of mutual literary congratulation. I went to fetch an open bottle of wine from the kitchen. Knowing I couldn't present it in that state, I dug out an old glass decanter, gave it a quick wash and wipe and poured the wine into it. Then, on impulse, I emptied in the remains from a gin bottle as well. The last party at the flat had been a sordid drinking affair, but now it seemed as if there would be a payoff after all. When I returned with a decanter and a couple of glasses, she seemed enthralled by the bohemian gesture. Your poetry, she said, as I sat beside her on the creaky old sofa. It's so worldly, so knowing. She began to take long pulls from her glass, hiding a grimace and drinking the wine as if it was shandy. The best laid plans. I hadn't expected such a rapid result. There were few more coherent statements from her. Intoxicated laughter then general babbling, and finally stupor subsumed everything. I had my arm around her, but she lay slumped inertly against me. What to do? She was incapable, out for the count. It would have been impossible to get her back to where she lived, wherever that was. I had little choice but to make arrangements for her in the flat. She was surprisingly heavy, but after a struggle, and then some fumbling with buttons, zips and catches, I let her flop onto the bed. I looked at her lying like a beautiful, broken marionette before covering her with the bedspread. I went around the flat, locking up and turning off the fire before standing at the light switch and weighing up the options. There were few. An Eskimo wouldn't survive a night on that sofa. It wasn't the way I wanted it, but I quickly undressed, switched off the light and slipped in beside her. Even by the standards of that winter, the morning was cold. I hadn't slept well, and I was woken early by the deep-throated rattle beside me. I climbed stiffly out of bed and reached for my pants and t-shirt. Switching on the fire, I held my jeans over the single bar, letting the steam rise from them for as long as I could bear the cold. Then I quickly finished dressing and went to boil the kettle. A glance out of the small kitchen window was the confirmation I didn't really need. Snow had fallen overnight. As I looked towards the cathedral, I could see the series of rooftops and chimney pots had the look of a Victorian Christmas card. But closer to home, any semblance of purity was lost as early traffic churned slush into curbsides. The side streets hadn't been gritted. Cars slithered around with their back wheels spinning and a black pole rose from each exhaust pipe. I shuddered and poured boiling water from the kettle. When I returned, with a mug in each hand, I was surprised to find the eiderdown lying in an untidy heap in the middle of an empty bed. A desperate retching from the bathroom answered my question, and it wasn't long before she returned to the room looking like hell. Splashes of vomit flecked the front of a shirt of mine she'd borrowed. 
Saying good morning seemed inappropriate, as she barely made eye contact with me anyway. I've made you a coffee, I said. No answer. Swamped by my shirt, she looked oddly vulnerable as she moved gingerly around the room collecting her things. She dressed with surprising immodesty, and my volunteering to leave the room wasn't acknowledged. It was clear that she was preparing to leave. Don't you want this coffee? The door slammed. Obviously not. 